Hey folks, Alan Mandic, Mandic Really here. Have you ever wondered about 3D printing chocolate or are you normal? In this video, we're gonna do an interview with a chocolate 3D printing company based right here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We're gonna learn about details of printing chocolate, some of the mechanics of the machine and important advice such as when I'm doing machines, if I'm eating a candy bar or something, don't drop it in my motors. Awesome. Especially not repeatedly. It's the Mountain Dew in the keyboard situation. More life lessons <laughs> like that and beyond in this video. Let's check it out. The Cocoa Press 3D printer we have here in front of us. Who are you and what do you have to do with this machine? Yeah, so I'm Ellie, a uh, founder of Cocoa Press, and I've been working on chocolate 3D printing for about eight years now. Uh, full time for the last four. I've built a lot of chocolate printers and this one's the newest one. <laughs> this is a clearly unique 3D printer. It's not your standard. It almost looks more like a pellet extruder or something like mm -hmm. that, but not clearly as well. Core XY kinematics. We've got this big extruder housing in the middle of this thing. Can you talk us through a little bit of what we're looking at? What is going on here? This printer is based on the Voron V0.1 and we worked with uh, Max, who's RCF, the founder of the Voron project on this new design. Like you said, standard Core XY printer. What we started to find is that once you're printing in chocolate, there's some things that are much harder about building a printer, but there's also things that are easier. So we don't have a heated bed, so we can actually bolt a 3D print right into the bed and we don't need some of that difficult assembly for the under the bed mechanism. We do need it to be more cleanable so we can change where the acrylic is so that you can wipe off chocolate more easily. But the biggest difference is of course the extruder where all of the chocolate for the print is heated up at one time. So instead of feeding the filament in, we have a syringe full of chocolate inside of here that's being heated to just below body temperature to be able to print with. So there's no bed heater in here, but I also don't see any part cooling. Since you're printing at fairly lower temperatures, do you really not find that to be a need, an issue? Yeah, with this printer, we have a new uh, formulation of chocolate that will solidify at up to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So we can print even in warmer rooms. You might not get the overhangs and stuff you want when it's warmer in the room, but we don't need any part cooling. It's very simple from that, that point of view. With that, you said there's a syringe of chocolate in there we're heating up mm -hmm. and you have a formulation that you use with this machine. Is it proprietary? Will somebody be able to use just a, another chocolate if they have something they really like? Or do you have that worked out at this point? People can definitely use their own chocolate with the machine. It's gonna be a little bit harder, um, but we'll write a blog article, we'll help people try to do it. I will say our cartridges will probably give people better luck with, with the printer. And then if it's a chocolate shop that wants to use their own chocolate, we can work with them on exactly how to make those chocolate cores for the printer. I'm like really interested in the actual mechanics of what you have going on here. Yeah. What, are, what are you running for electronics in this machine? So we're running the Ultimachine Machine Arkham board on here. We're running Marlin because I could not get the temperature control good enough on Clipper. You know, I just couldn't get a 10th of a Celsius degree accuracy. Their PID tuning wasn't quite as good as Marlin's. And obviously temperature accuracy is, is a lot of what makes this printer work. Uh, we have a dual heating system. So we have two different heaters in there. Uh, do they have independent temperature sensors? Yep, they have independent temperature sensors, independent heaters. They are connected physically, so, so it's not a fully independent system, right. but one is just the, say, last couple inches and mm -hmm. one is the rest of the body. Extrusion temperature versus pre-chamber, effectively. Yeah, prepared. and generally we just keep them at about a tenth of a degree Celsius. So the nozzle is about a tenth of a degree warmer, so that doesn't clog. When you're talking about 1% difference at 200 degrees Celsius, it's vastly different than 1% difference at 50 degrees Celsius. or Definitely. Water. We're at 32 degrees Celsius, generally. Yeah. So we're... We're trying to stay within a pretty pretty tight zone for, for heating up the chocolate. Yep, so we're using LDO motors, we're using LDO for the kit. Um, our touch UI is based off of the Wellsbot touch UI, the, their bio printer. And we worked with Marcio who headed up that project um, at Wellsbot. The extruder assembly, obviously a large component of the system. <laughs> is that all designed by you in house? Do, do you take off the shelf stuff you had to make work for this or purpose made components? Almost the whole extruder is custom stuff. So there's two custom pieces of steel, a big custom piece of aluminum in there. And then LDO made us a custom motor for the extruder. And then there's, I think just one off the shelf part part in that whole extruder. That's, that's a lot of the core of the printer, a lot of the core of the system. The extruder motor, I can see a lead screw and a linear mm -hmm. rod here. Clearly that's the plunger system for the syringe. Mm -hmm. 
Is it a pass-through type motor where the lead screw is running through the motor or? Yeah, yeah so it's a non-captive stepper motor on the extruder. It puts about 10 pounds of force on the chocolate and uh, seems to be enough to get it to extrude. So you mentioned kits. You're looking to be selling kits of this particular design, correct? Yeah. Is anything going to change from this version to the kit form that you're aware of at the moment? Or I think this is pretty darn close to the final prototype. I mean, we're calling it the alpha. You know, we'll, we'll make beta printers, we'll send them out and, and see what people make. But there's nothing major at this point that we plan to change between this version and actually releasing it. So with that whole assembly, you have the syringe mechanism in there. I'd assume that's got food safety standards come into play with that. What's been the challenges in that direction? Definitely. The biggest challenge is how do you clean everything? Obviously, it's chocolate. It's really messy. With this printer, the chocolate only touches four components and they can all be washed in the sink and you can remove them from the printer without any tools. So there's two pieces are stainless steel, the nozzle and the body of the cartridge. Then there is a polypropylene plunger in there. And then there's the silicone baking mat. And so that's all the chocolate touches. They can all be removed without any tools and wash in the sink. So it's, it's actually relatively clean and relatively easy. What? It's very pretty. <laughs> I was, you know, I was going for an aesthetic like machine that would look good in a chocolate shop, would look good on someone's, uh, you know, background of a, of a channel, would look good. Just, yeah. I, f I think the aesthetics are really important in, in printers and really important in, in hardware. And so I'm, yeah. As a creator myself, like I'm always focused on, people ask me, oh, why don't you build this printer? Why'd you build a Voron? Like Rat Rig versus Voron. Sure. And my go-to answer is, I like the way the Voron looks better. Yeah. I like, I understand that's kind of a silly reason to build the yeah. machine, but I'm a content creator. And when I'm taking pictures or filming time lapses, the way the machine looks does matter. And what's nice is that there's actually a lot of overlap between a machine looking good and being food safe. Mm -hmm. Like if there are no cracks, if there's no seams visible, that's safer for food, that's easier to clean. Um, so one of the big changes was just from the V0.1, the sheet is in between the extrusion. Mm -hmm. And for this, we just moved it right on top. There's so many less seams, chocolate is in there. I think it looks better. So that, that overlap is also kind of nice. You know, up here we put these pieces on the top that serve no other purpose other than to hide the motors. But that also means chocolate's not gonna get in the motor. I've broken a few motors in the past while prototyping. Uh, uh, chocolate and motors don't go well together. Just an FYI in case you were curious. I don't think I'm going to have that problem anytime soon, but that is really good information to have. <laughs> always good to be prepared. I mean, you know, it's the situations you're not prepared for that always catch you. So now I know when I'm doing machines, if I'm eating a candy bar or something, don't <laughs> drop it in my motors. Awesome. Especially not repeatedly. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Mountain Dew in the keyboard situation. <laughs> How many iterations of chocolate printers have you gone through at this point? Can you even put a number to it? So this one, depending on how you count it, is number seven or eight. I did my original printer in my senior year of high school when I started this project for fun. And then the second version for fun over the summer brought that one to a maker fair. Uh, the third one was my senior design capstone project. This is where it starts to get a little murky, but like I think like the fourth and fifth ones maybe were once I was doing it full time. And then the sixth one I actually sold. Then it depends if you want to count this as the seventh or the V0.1 version as the seventh. But I've made a lot of random ones that don't quite fit as neatly into that timeline. Um, but safe to say I've built at least six to eight different chocolate printers. I think it's probably safe to say you're the most experienced chocolate 3D printer out there at this point. I don't know if you want to make that claim, but I mean like, from my perspective, I'm not really sure who else has said. I can at least make the claim that I'm the only one in the US currently trying to commercialize chocolate 3D printing. So with the kit form of which talking about selling here as this version, mm -hmm. will folks be expected to print their own components? Will you be doing a print service where you'll sell kits with printed parts or some without? I may add a, a way for people to buy the printed parts as well with it, but I want to make sure for the kit, it's people who have previous 3D printing experience and not a chocolate shop who is going to try to build the kit and then uh, we'll need that additional support. So the fully assembled version, it'll be the same printer, but it will we'll come with some extra support. It will come with that. It'll be meant for businesses, mm -hmm. um, whereas the kit will be meant for consumers. Um, so I think 3D printing the parts is kind of a good way to say, you should have some previous experience with this. And it doesn't require, you know, ABS or anything. It, it's, it's chocolate. We're not, we're not doing a, a heated bed. We're not doing anything too hot. So it's, 
PTG is fine. Taking the product to chocolate shops, things like that. I feel like as somebody who teaches people about 3D printing, there's probably yeah. a uphill battle when it comes to that. Well, I've seen you go to chocolate shows and event shows. Do you find the reception overall positive or skeptical? Like what's your perception there? The responses are anywhere from, we're proud that we make everything by hand, which again, incredible, to wow, we turn down over $10,000 a year in custom orders because we have to buy a mold and we have to wait six weeks for that mold. And if you're saying we could potentially have something within a couple of days, just making sure people's expectations line up with reality. The last thing I want is to sell someone a machine and then have them think that it's gonna make something in seconds when we know it's 3D printing, it takes on the orders of hours. And then the concept of what is printable and what is not yeah. printable and printable in chocolate versus printable in plastic is I'm sure slightly different animal, though I've seen you doing quite a bit of stuff that I never would have expected to be able to do, so. That I also never would have been <laughs> expected to be able to do. The fact that I'm now making print in place gears, articulated fish, I mean, it's, it's crazy how far this has come from my original design that could, I think the tallest thing was 15 layers or so. And now, you know, I'm doing hundreds of layers and, and moving components in chocolate. When it comes to slicing, chocolate 3D prints. Have there been any challenges with the slicer options that are out there? Like, do they allow you to go as low as temperatures you need? Do you have to post process for that? I've had a lot of issues over the years with slicing. Right now is the first time that I've been able to just use off the shelf Prusa slicer with some profile. I have had custom circuitry for extrusion. I've run things through post processing scripts. I have trick slicers into doing things that they were not meant to do. In terms of temperature, it's a little bit different than plastic printing. It has to go through a preheat cycle for the chocolate. And so you actually do that all on board on the screen. And on the slicer, you just say temperature is zero. Um, don't worry about the temperature. But that's also nice because then you can use milk chocolate, dark chocolate, white chocolate without actually using different G code um, because all the temperature is controlled on the printer. So it's like a little bit different, but it's, I wouldn't call it better or worse. So I have to ask, why the V0 or the design philosophy of the V0? Why did you choose that direction? One thing was simply, I have a tall extruder. I have a heavy extruder. What in a small form factor can hold a, at the time, three pound extruder, now a little closer to two pound extruder, also not have you know a bar on top that it's going to run into and, and stuff like that. So a lot of it was really just the practical side of it. Chocolate printing is very finicky and has in the past been very finicky. The easiest way to make it work well is to control all of the variables. That's why I think having your own machine that does it is really nice. Obviously a smaller market than if I'm selling a small add-on for a machine, but I can make the precise temperature control that I want. I can make sure that all works and without having to figure out every version of every different manufacturer's printer and, and try to interface with that. Why would somebody want to 3D print chocolate versus molds and pouring chocolate? Do you have like a go-to answer for why? why? I think there's a few reasons that 3D printing chocolate makes sense from a commercial standpoint specifically. One is that you can make custom chocolate without needing a custom mold. So those can be $500 plus and take six weeks is, is on the short end for something like that. Where we know with 3D printing, if you already have the design, you can have it within a few hours. You can also make stuff that's not possible to make with traditional chocolate making. So think gyroid infill, lattice structures, weird overhangs, or that would be hard to take out of a two-part mold. So you can just do more complicated stuff and then combine that with the personalization, suddenly you're doing things that no one else in the chocolate industry can do. I'm excited when I get this in other people's hands to see what other things people come up with. Okay, the fact that it's built around a Voron, I totally understand the design philosophy, the open source nature. What's it doing for speed? I know that was not a core design mm -hmm. philosophy with this machine focusing on speed, but people want to know. What are you running yeah. for accelerations and print speeds on average? So in terms of the printer, it is a Core XY. It actually wasn't designed that way for speed specifically. It's very nice because you can hide the motors in the back and get them away from the food zone. But in terms of the speeds, I'm now going up to about 45 millimeters per second with I think infill speeds and closer to 15 or 20 with the external perimeters. But it's also running a 0.8 millimeter nozzle, so that speeds it up a little bit. 
it's been a journey. It's been a journey. This is definitely the most polished printer so far. We've talked a lot about the design philosophy of this machine and, and what's going into its development, but we kind of skipped over a few of the, the basics. Like, what's the build volume on the machine? The build volume is a six by six by six inch cube, but the important part is that you generally can't max out both the width and the height. So you're a little more limited by the 70 grams of chocolate that's stored in the extruder. So it's designed so that you can go either something wide, think like names or a flat object, or something tall, like maybe a vase or a, a head or a cake topper. I've seen on Twitter your discussions of the evolution of the machine. You've polled people a couple times about like USB sticks versus yeah. SD cards versus network connectivity. And have you explored Duet hardware? Or are you happy with Marlin? You feel that's going to meet your needs? I've looked at all of the things a lot of times. I think one of the most important things with this printer is to get the UI right. And I think it's honestly commonly overlooked in 3D printers, and especially when I'm going to a chocolate shop. And if they see something that doesn't look easy to use, that doesn't look like their iPhone app, it's going to be a harder sell. And so I've put so much time into making this beautiful UI that runs on Marlin. And that's what keeps me coming back to the Ultimachine Machine boards and, and Marlin and, and the Wolfsbot Touch UI. It's easy to use. You know, there's a nice touch screen with buttons. It's clear on what to do. Um, I think that that is such an important part of product design when trying to teach 3D printing to people who don't have technical experience. And especially because I go to all of these trade shows, Having to figure out the Wi-Fi at all of the different places is really difficult, I've learned. Just having something that runs offline locally, not to mention, I don't want to be open to any security issues in the future. If it's already, you know, air-gapped, basically, I don't know if that's the right term for it, but it's not connected to the internet, you're just going off the SD card or USB. It's so much easier from a support side, too, because if I'm not an expert in Quipper, I can't sell something that uses it because I need will need someone to do that support when a chocolate shop can't figure out how to put the Wi-Fi credentials on the card. You are going to end up being their IT support yeah. if you don't want to get a bad review. We all know that it's not your fault that they're having yeah. Wi-Fi issues because they're in a really busy downtown, but they're going to blame you. One thing I've noticed about this machine is the tilting extruder head. Mm -hmm. Why? I think it's neat, but why? to get the cartridge in and out. It's a bottom loading cartridge system. Um, in past machines, we've put a hole in the bed so that you can get it down. It tilts so much easier. <laughs> and it's actually very repeatable too, which is, which is somewhat surprising. So just tilts, take out the thumb screw, pushing it out. There it is. I think we've covered pretty much everything that I had to talk about and yeah. so much more about the Coco Press machine that you have here in front of us and a bit of the history of yeah. the company and the machines. So Ellie, thank you so much for thank coming you. and talking to us about this. Where can folks find you when they are interested in learning more about Coco Press? I guess the first place is just cocopress.com. I'll have a new website at some point in the future. Shouldn't promise dates anymore. And then I post a lot about it, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff on my Twitter, which is Eliana Rose 66 I'm on all the social medias, so on TikTok, um, same handle, on YouTube, and... We'll throw yeah. some links in the description down below. On the and internet, the, the, the World Wide Web. <laughs> you can find me. I'm, I'm pretty easy to get in contact with. The Coco Press printer shows an entirely different side to additive manufacturing that I probably never would have thought of on my own. So I really want to thank Ellie for bringing it by and showing it to us. I very briefly featured Coco Press in my Earth 2022 video. You can see that right here if you haven't caught it already. Drop the video a like if you found it interesting. I think that's gonna wrap it up for this one, folks. Get subscribed to ensure your 3D prints don't fail. It's not a guarantee, but it can't hurt. See ya.